So thank you very much for joining us for our first live Ned Book Club. Now, the way I would like to introduce you is just to say that you are a model and an author, because you are. You're a very successful model. You've worked for Vogue, you've been in Allure magazine, you've done campaigns for massive beauty brands. But actually, the reason why we're here is about your book, Missed It, that talks about the, your journey, the journey that you went through to become a model. And really, I think when I, when I think see your name, uh, as, as a fashion journalist, someone that worked in the industry for a long time, is the impact that you made on the fashion industry that is so important and so valuable. Um, people call you a body activist, which I think kind of fits the bill, because the book, and I, I don't know if you've all read the book, really just talks about your childhood and how you got into modelling. Now, as someone who used to book models for a living, so I was a fashion editor for a really long time, it actually really upset me. It was brutal. So you decided you were going to be a model. You were scouted numerous times, but it all came down to the tape measure, really, yeah. ultimately. Back then, you had to look a certain way. Social media didn't exist. I would go into agencies and they would, you know, they cast me and then it was always, once you get down to a 34 inch hip, then we'll sign you. It was just madness. And I look back now and I'm like, like, what is this, and, you know? Um, things are changing now, obviously, with social media and like, you know, the plus size movements becoming a bit more prominent and stuff. But I mean, God, it's just insane. And when you're saying these to 16 year olds and then wonder why they have mental health issues, it's like, why do you think? Because you're putting all this pressure on them. So, yeah, I mean, it's just not normal, you know? So I guess what is incredible about this book is that you now have the benefit of hindsight. You have you, you've modelled, you've seen the negative side, you've come out, you've talked about the industry and now you're modelling again. So you're in a kind of in your sort of happy, safe space. Mm. What's great about this book for me is that, I mean, I have a young daughter and you really do explain because you have a really good understanding now of someone that's had an eating disorder, someone that's felt the pressures of modern life and of modelling, how, how, th how things influence us and what impacted you as you were growing up. Yeah, so I wanted to write a book that was that went back as to why eating disorders happen. Usually they, they start with OCD, they start with anxiety and or depression. Um, I've spoken before about it kind of being like a Venn diagram. So most people that I've ever met with eating disorders, and I've met hundreds of people now, um, either have anxiety, depression and OCD. And so and then in the middle, when they all connect, that's when you can kind of control food. It's control. I think it, that's a good word. Yeah, yeah. it's control. And so when I went back, it was more like a, just a way of me understanding really um, why these things happen. And I've been to um, cognitive behavioral therapy yeah. to try and understand where these things arise, but they all start from an incident in childhood, comments from childhood, um, comments around you, you know, media inf influence. Um, you talk about your friend group at school and there was one girl who was particularly quite kind of obsessed really about how almost ranking you all about your size. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that um, must have had a huge impact. Yeah, I mean, we were eight or nine and she would like rank us, she'd line us up and she'd rank us in, in, in order of skinniness and, uh, in, in, you know, order from skinny to, to big. And I just felt like... I didn't want to be, I wanted to be the thinnest. It was like, it was this competitive thing within me. Girls are competitive. Girls are competitive. Mm. And the girl who was the skinniest was the prettiest one. She had all the boys after her. She was very, you know, she did amazing, amazingly in sports and in school. And I was like, well, that's what I want to be. So you were so, quite thin with popular, yeah, happy. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, it's, it's quite clever how your brain can, can do that. But also um, eating disorders tend to happen to people who are quite intelligent. Um, middle class, upper class people, white women. Um, so yeah, it, you know, they, they can affect anyone, but there are just loads of different things that you learn over the years. And I want to continue writing about that, but this was definitely a good start. Yeah. yeah. The other interesting thing, because obviously I was, I used to, but Curve didn't exist. We didn't, no. it, there was just a main board. You'd have new faces and then suddenly you have Curve Division or whatever they like to call it. Mm. Um, and I don't know how I feel about that word. Sometimes I've got, sometimes I get quite upset about it because w what's that mean? We all have curves. Yeah. So what, it, it, you're normal if you're straight and if you're not straight, then you're, you're I, how do you feel about that word curve? You know, it's just about accept, like understanding what that, what that word means. Mm. Um, because you can meet people who are size zero who are really, um, who've got curves and things like that. Um, but yeah, there have been times in my modeling career and stuff where people have approached me and gone, 
how dare you say that you're plus size and it's like hang on a second i actually haven't put myself in that category no nope. it's like you know taking um, one extreme to another and placing me in the plus size category when i'm quite clearly not that's just an industry word um but for the last kind of i, th I guess three or four years i've been really championing um, the in-between size, so the girls... As an industry, we still have a problem, right? The model has a problem, yeah. because you are absolutely... Not, you're not a curve model, but you don't fit into the category of the girls that maybe would fit, you know, within those ridiculous dimensions of the tape measure. But you really are the ideal. Really, what the model agency should be is representing women, and they should just have a board of models mm. that are... The size they are well i mean some agencies are already doing it there's like mass there's like the giants like img and a lot of the really big talent agencies they don't have separate boards anymore uh no they have one giant board yeah. which is how it should be you yeah. shouldn't have all these divisions so it is kind of moving in that direction mm. and the thing is is that modeling is a skill whether or not people you know believe that or not um you know not everyone can model no which is what we've learned i think through the whole influencer you know, booking influencers and stuff just for campaigns yeah. because I think that's starting to die out now as well. Um, it is a skill to have and I think there are beautiful girls of every different shape and shape size. There's, there's one girl that I um, that I worked with called, uh, I think it's Ta Tabrea or Tabria mm -hmm. Majors, who's like a size 24, but she is so beautiful, it's unreal. And she's done Fenty campaign, she's done... Um, just huge things and she's absolutely stunning and then I've met other girls who are you know my size I met girls who are like super skinny it, it's it really should just be one board what is it do you think within us and within society that makes us want to sort of strive for perfection what, mm. what is this thing that it, 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 can't, it has to be something that's not easily attainable that we have to kind of set these standards I, I think like you were saying I think women are competitive and I think actually a lot of the time women place that those pressures on themselves yeah. um it's not men it's not really straight men writing you know these gossipy magazines it's women mm. um it you know fashion is a very female dominated world so i think a lot of it comes down to that yeah pressure mm. we're putting on ourselves yeah. yeah um but we have to you know stop this notion that being thin equates to popularity or fame or success or beauty or whatever it is you know we have to stop um, and using the word normal, what's normal? Well, exactly. I mean, you know, we now know that BMI doesn't actually make much sense. In no. fact, a lot of people argue against it and they want it scrapped. So, yeah, it's, it's mad. Yeah, it is mad. Um, so, obviously, you're still modelling now. You're still d d sort of a body activist, if you like. Um, I really liked an interview that you did for Vogue magazine. And, of course, it's Mental Awareness Month. Um, and you talked about sort of tools that you can teach yourself and things you can do to be confident. Because I think that's definitely, if I could teach my daughter or I could teach people anything, it would be that. I mean, to have the gift of confidence. And I really like the fact that you, you stressed that it's not something you're born with. I think some of us, when you're not feeling confident, you think, oh, well, I'm just not confident. That's something I'm not going to have and I'm not that person. But it is something you can teach yourself. So, and you were very succinct in that interview with Vogue. So kind of just sum up what, what you, you said in there. I mean, I don't want to say it, say it for you. Yeah, I just, you know, confidence is something that is taught. You're very lucky if you can, you know, be born and then just live your life, you know, completely um, comfortable with yourself and, and um, comfortable in who you are. Because obviously, again, like I was saying, society and external pressures and things like to like to put you down especially women they like to put women down so a lot of it is definitely you know a, a learning curve and i'm still learning to be confident i mean i get days when i'm super anxious still and i'm like oh my god everything's going wrong blah, blah, blah. and when the negative thoughts come in mm. i think it's it, you, it's like sometimes your brain will take you back to a place and it's, mm. it's a place that you're used to repeating the kind of reaffirming those negative messages to yourself how yeah. do you stop that well can i just talk about affirmation really quickly because yeah. that's a really big like that word yeah so um i don't know if you guys you know know about this but i love positive affirmations mm. they make such a difference so you know even if you're looking in the mirror every day you can start off your day with a positive thought and actually the more the more times you do it the more positive you will be and the more i guess you you attract positive things into your life because yeah. when I'm not really into the whole like spiritual hippy dippy side of it, but I think from like a 
a science point of view. I, I really believe in it in that sense. So that, you know, again, when it comes to confidence, if you wake up every day and you, and it sounds a bit cringe, but you look at yourself and you go, I've got a really nice smile, or I'm a really nice friend, or like whatever it is, you start believing it and that adds to your confidence. Cognitive behavioral therapy, for those of you who don't know, really teach you how to, how to break those, those feelings and thoughts down, especially if you're a very sensitive person like myself. Yeah. Okay, has anyone got any questions that they'd like to ask? Probably not as long as I should have been. I was there for about a year um, and it got very expensive. <laughs> 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 and it was in New York it was um yeah it was quite expensive but um I kind of felt like I I, I learned quite quickly because I, I learned all the associations with OCD and stuff like that and understanding the steps as to why you feel a certain way um so yeah I, I'd, I'd like to go back actually and I'd like to um do it again but we'll see right now right now I feel good <laughs> Yeah, um, actually towards, say the first lockdown, I was like, oh, okay, whatever, it'll be over soon, like fine, whatever. The second lockdown, like around Christmas, I don't know about you guys, but I just had this like, oh my God, this is never gonna end. Mm -hmm. I was really, I was crying for like a week. I was like, I'm so fed up with this. And again, like I was saying, I really suffer with anxiety. So my anxiety was just through the roof. I was like, there is no end in sight. And obviously anxiety means you think in the future. So I was like, oh my God, it's never gonna end, it's never gonna end. Um, so yeah, no, it definitely did. And in terms of like the eating disorders and stuff, there were definitely times where suddenly you think, oh, if I, if I restrict um, my food, it, it's, it's a thought, but you know, if, maybe if I restrict it, maybe I feel a bit better. And then suddenly you're like, no, 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 what, what are you talking about? So again, it's like, every day is like trying to, to stop those thoughts from happening because it's so ingrained. It doesn't ingrained. go away, does it? No. You're suddenly going to have a year of therapy and you're never going to no. count a calorie again in your life and you're never going to feel anxious. Yeah. But I guess it's about giving you the tools to cope and to recognise when it starts. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's an addiction and mm. a lot of people don't think eating swords are, are an addiction, but bulimia especially is an addiction. It's just you get this high after being sick. You get this high from, you know, binge eating and, and purging and all that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's trying to, to stop that incessant need to reward yourself um, and to feel that relief, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I had never understood it. I didn't understand mm -hmm. being until I read your book, and mm -hmm. I do feel like I understand it now. Um, so, <laughs> so as a child, I, I had this thing called intrusive thoughts, things in your head that go, you're a really bad person, um, or like you've murdered someone. And so like, you know, a lot of people when they, you know, when, when there's like a murder, you get the police get loads of phone calls saying that they've done it because their brains are literally telling them that they've done it. So a lot of that is intrusive thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, I would just have so many, like I've been sexually abused or, and I, I had, but like, you know, thoughts I've been sexually abused, it, um, thoughts that I, about sex and like being really terrified of sex and, and what that meant and um, OCD just, you know, really, <laughs> It was, it was just an insane form of OCD, sorry. So um, I had that, I didn't deal with that at all because that was like the weirdest thing. I was like, so embarrassing. I don't even know why I went through this. And then, you know, I'd, I'd always had the OCD with germs. Um, so, you know, I've got like a load of hand sanitizers if anyone wants any, because I still <laughs> <laughs> I still love that. So, you know, when COVID came around, that was great. <laughs> you were um, ready. Yeah, I was ready, but um, eating disorders are again, another form of OCD. So it's like the calorie counting, the um, obsessive taking notes of, of what you've eaten, the exercise, it's, you know, rounding down to the nearest number or rounding up to the nearest number when it comes to calorie intake. It's, um, you're so uh, regimented, I guess, by, by food and numbers and calories and it becomes so obsessive and it's literally something you think about from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. And when you go to sleep, everything feels calm. Um, but it's, it's, it's just insane. You just become so overwhelmed by it. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, again, you know, I, I really wanna try explaining this more in like interviews and stuff because people don't see it that way, but it is a massive addiction and it's a massive, massive form of OCD. Yeah, so it's more, more closely related actually to OCD than, than just about, people think it starts with, it doesn't start with the dieting, does it? That's 
No, but well, it you know, maybe you're on a diet and then you lose weight, but then it's like, oh, I'll get down to, I'll lose another stone and then I'll lose another stone and you, you become very competitive within yourself. And then yeah. if you eat a burger, you think, oh my God, the world's going to come to an end because now I've, you know, I've destroyed that. And then maybe you'd be sick, um, you know, make yourself throw up or like whatever it is. I mean, just drives you mad. <laughs> but yeah, but now, you know, I'm, I'm really getting control of the OCD. And actually, once I got control of the OCD, which again is what I was explaining about the CBT thing, um, that really helped me yeah. get a grasp on it. Yeah. And I mean, do you still count calories in your head? Does it no. ever leave you? No, no I actually don't. Yeah. Um, again, during lockdown, there were times where I was like looking on the back of a packet and thinking, hmm, how much is, mm. you know, is on that? But no, not, not anymore. No, I'm quite proud of myself for that, really. Yeah. Because mm, I used to be like a rain man, like a chocolate rain man. Like I knew every calorie and every, you know, crisp packet and, and everything. It was insane, but. Kate Moss, let's say Kate Moss is, is doing really well in the 90s because suddenly she's cracked this new thing and it's heroin chic. Suddenly another agency will go, hang on a minute, we can jump on that bandwagon. So then they get their girls to diet. It's also very, very short lived. So, you know, you've got to get them down to that size uh, whilst it's still popular. And then it just it just never really went away. I mean, you know, it's still going on 2005. If you remember all those skinny um, blonde models, that, that's what I kind of grew up with. Um, when you think about it, in the 80s, they were relatively healthy looking. The models. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they were, were stunning. And they curvy. were tall. Yeah, but like, yeah, they were they were size that was, 10s. That was normal men. Yeah. It, then it just all changed and it never yeah. really ever went back to any kind of realistic. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it can be very bitchy. So I think that as well, people don't like to challenge the status quo. Also, a lot of agents that come out of the that, that, that work at these um, agencies, they've just come out of uni. They don't have a clue about bodies. If they've grown up knowing that heroin chic or or size zero is like the in thing, then why would they want to change that? You know, why would they want to challenge that? It takes, it, it really is an industry, um, it needs someone in, within the industry who's powerful to really change that. And it's taken God such a long time, you know, but it is starting to happen. I mean, when I grew up, I would, especially when I looked at models in the 90s, I just assumed that they were just lucky. Mm. Oh, those girls are just super skinny, they're just lucky. It never occurred to me that they were starving themselves to look like that. I just thought yeah. they were freaks of nature and that, that that's, that's, you know, they, they ate McDonald's every day and God, aren't they, you know, lucky them. Mm, mm. You don't realise there's a sinister side behind it. No. I, mean, I worked in the industry and I didn't realise it was as bad as that. Yeah, no. And then again, you know, when you have the internal voice in your head saying that you're fat and then the exter external voices from like your agents or from, you know, um, going on shoots and stuff from, from people in, in that side also telling you and validating those feelings that you have and then reading magazines where they're also super skinny you just think okay this is how it's meant to be yeah. you know you as a young girl you don't have the confidence to to challenge that really mm. yeah I mean you know it can just be small things it's like running a bath it's 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 shampooing your hair it's just taking basic care of yourself and I just I never gave a shit and part of me wonders if maybe I didn't you know book modeling jobs because I genuinely hated myself so much that I didn't give a shit about what I wore um you know I was super concerned about about everything and I was just so like closed off and and everything so I didn't really have the confidence but again you know just looking after yourself can really boost your confidence and, and make you feel better and also you talk about the fact that you couldn't be in the here and now and I think a lot of the planning, the, 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 the denial, the mm. punishment, it's all about looking forward. Yeah. What, you're going to get thin, you're going to be this, you're going to get that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they, I read that, that's a quote, isn't it? It's like, happiness is the here and now, depression is the past, anxiety is the future, but mm. you, you, feel, you feel content when you're in the moment. Yeah, well, it really is changing. Um, Again, I don't believe in like labels and I really hate that tokenistic aspect of fashion. So it's like, oh, well, if it's not super skinny, then it's super large. Because yeah. again, like we were talking about, it should just be every body shape because I believe that every girl should be represented, but every woman should be represented. But um, yeah, I, th there are loads of models coming through now who are like very much in the middle. Um, 
I guess my size, bigger, you know, just, just look like girls in the street, that kind of thing. A lot of them are landing Vogue covers, they're getting massive campaigns, which is, which is amazing. It was like all locked down last year, but last year was really when all these in-betweenies, again, I hate that word, but in-betweenies started popping up and now they're just starting to really hit the mainstream. But there are, there are a lot, of, I, I think Vogue actually did an article on it if you want to Google that, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. I mean, thank I, you. I could go on and on, but I never <laughs> stop talking, so I will stop talking. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs>